Welcome everyone. My name is Anna Juma Rusta. I'm the director of the Europe Center. And today in our speaker series, we're absolutely delighted to have Simon Hicks speak to us. Simon is the Stein Rocken Chair in Comparative Politics at the European University Institute in Florence. And before that, he was the Harold Lasky Chair in the London School of Economics, as well as playing a whole host of important roles at that institution. He is an expert in the politics of the European Union, parliaments, and democratic institutions, and the author of four books on European politics and the editor of A Further Two. His work has been published in a variety of top journals um, in the social sciences, as well as the BBC, The Guardian, um, The Daily Telegraph, and other leading newspapers. And so today, we're delighted to welcome him as he will explain to us the new young liberals, an emerging force in European politics. Welcome, Simon. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me get started straight away. So this is a paper from a new project of mine. It's actually, I realized uh, today as we went up the Hoover Institute, Institution Tower, it's a very Stanford paper. And you'll you realize why as I talk through it. So, so um, why isn't this going? Hold on. There you go. Um, what we've seen over the last, say, decade in European politics is, is a growth in support for liberal parties, liberal in a European sense. So sort of free market liberal plus socially liberal. So uh, socially pro-gay rights, pro-gender equality, pro-environment, uh, um, pro-climate change policies, but also liberal free market. And so th this is a perhaps not unusual in American politics, but quite unusual in, in European politics. Um, we've seen, of course, Macron in France, FDP in Germany, uh, D66 in Holland, Liberal Alliance in, in, in Denmark, a, a new party in Switzerland called the Green Liberals, just to give you a sense of a free market Green Party. And then also quite strong in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, and then recently in the Australian election, we saw a new force called the Teal Independence. And Teal is meant to be, they call it Teal because it's a combination of blue and green. So they broke away from the mainstream conservatives on the right. And across Europe, as, as conservative parties become more socially conservative to compete with more radical right parties, you're gradually seeing this force emerging uh, who don't want to vote for the, the mainstream conservative parties who, who are becoming more socially conservative. So having watched this, I thought, how broad is this phenomenon? How systematic is this phenomenon? How large is this block of voters? And then we, you know, we had the German election and, and, and there was sort of horror amongst uh, some of my German colleagues and students at the EUI. Oh my God, these young Germans are voting for the free Democrats. How on earth did that happen? And, in fact, you can see here the under 25s in, in Germany were voting overwhelmingly for Greens and, and the FDP. So in a sense, left liberals, the Greens, and right liberals, the FDP, are not voting for the two established parties compared to older generations. And then there was this lovely quote in, in the Financial Times, maybe these, these liberals, these new liberals are not quite so young. After all, Sebastian Payne, uh, a great writer in the FT, wrote, meet Catherine, the, this imaginary voter, is 48 with two children at secondary school living in a well-heeled Surrey suburb of Isha. Catherine and her partner work in the city, commuting in on a train a few days a week. She's socially liberal, small C conservative, preferring low taxes. Her reliance on the state is limited. She voted to remain in the EU but accepted Brexit. She was a natural Tory but has floated off to the Liberal Democrats. She is Waitrose woman. So my wife is a New Yorker. She said, how can I explain Waitrose? So, She's Whole Foods woman, I guess, would be the equivalent for, for California. Um, so I'll say a little bit about existing research in European party politics, and then I'll talk about what I think is, how do we think about who these people are, where are they coming from, why are they growing as a force, and then I'll show you the real results of, of two studies. One, a cross-sectional time series from European uh, social survey data across almost a 20-year period, and then uh, a panel study, uh, which is a study of actual individuals themselves over time uh, using UK British election study from 2014 to 2022. First of all, we've known for a while, and we've talked for a while in European politics about two dimensions of European politics. So classic economic left right, and a sort of cultural liberal traditional dimension. And we see three political forces up in the top left hand corner, and we see a couple of forces down in the bottom right hand corner. And we normally think about this as the main new dimension of politics, a sort of libertarian left and an authoritarian right. And we see these parties, the liberals themselves, gradually moving further up into that sort of free market, socially liberal corner, moving away from the center right and moving away also from social democrats and, and these parties in, in the top left hand corner. Um, if we look at the classic research and how it's sort of framed in Europe and how to understand European party politics, nobody really talks about right liberals. They assume they don't really exist. So 
Herbert Kitchell talks about left-wing libertarians against right-wing authoritarians, and that's the dominant dimension of European politics. We've got research by Urshan Renfeld, who talk about three poles in politics, the left liberals, the, the mainstream center-right, and then the radical right, and, and Piketty et al. in his research, um, famous name, talks about the, the Brahmin left against the merchant right, which in a sense is another way of, of agreeing with, with, with Kitchell. But we've known for a while, people have, have pointed out, well, hang on a minute, um, this is, you know, you're missing the fact that libertarian values also uh, are present on the right in, in, in European politics as well as on the left. And, and a lot of people in studying uh, Eastern Europe or from the region of Central Eastern Europe have said, wait a minute, actually, the dimension of politics in a lot of countries in Central Eastern Europe is from right, so free market social liberals against uh, more socially conservative um, left wing uh, voters. Why have we seen the growth in right liberals in European politics? Well, part of the story is expansion of university education. And for a while in the social sciences, we've been trying to identify what are the effects of education? You know, is it true that education turns people into a sort of woke uh, social liberals? Actually, the, the evidence suggests it doesn't. The evidence suggests that it may be, there's a big self-selection effect of people going to university who already have those values. Some of the research from an economic point of view shows that going to university actually leads to people having sort of more moderate economic views, but doesn't necessarily turn people into, into left wing on economics. In fact, if you said to me, you were going to randomly take somebody and put them in an environment where they were going to meet people from lots of different backgrounds, plus uh, possess a load of skills that would mean that they earn more money later in life, actually, my prior would be that going to university would make me people more free market in, on economics and more socially liberal on social questions. There's research that shows that digitization has created winners and losers, higher returns from education, um, uh, who tend and higher educated groups who would benef benefit from, from, uh, from digitize, growing digitization tend to support political status quo rather than more radical change. Younger voters tend to be more socially liberal. There's a great paper by Tom O'Grady at UCL in London who shows that in the UK context, younger voters are not necessarily left-wing on economic questions. They're actually left-wing and right-wing on, on economic questions. One of the key changes I think we've seen is the changing welfare state in Europe with growing groups of voters who are just not consuming public services anymore. They're, they're consuming healthcare, education, transport, pensions in the private sector. So you get large groups of voters who are like Catherine, uh, who Sebastian Payne described, who essentially are now consuming most of the services the state used to provide in the private sector. And they're, saying, so they're now saying, so why am I paying all these taxes anymore? Why am I getting back? That's a, very, that's a major transformation from 20 or 30 years ago where the middle classes in Europe were essentially consuming a lot of universal public benefits. As these benefits have been cut back, particularly since 2008, they tend to be now targeted, they're less universal. And so increasingly people are consuming things in the private sector. We also have more sort of risky sectors, just de declining in classic job for life, uh, people getting sort of precarious jobs in the new creative industries, fastest growing sectors in Europe are film, fashion, design, media, tech. Um, a lot of younger people who are highly skilled get jobs in these sectors um, and they're relatively short term contracts. A good friend of mine, Andy, runs an interior design for cruise ship business in Lond London. He employs the designers, he pays them incredible amounts of money. Andy himself is from Scotland. He's quite left wing and he's always moaning to me about his younger employees all vote Tory. How on earth, why on earth would they do this? And I said, you're obviously paying them too much, Andy. But this is, but, so, you know, but the, these are people who are saying, I, I want to hold on to my, I, I, it is, this is risky for me. I want to saving my money. I want to provide my own safety net. I want to cut taxes. I don't want the state to increase taxes. And so I think we're seeing a growing separation between public employment and people's experiences in the public sector and private employment. Private employment, more highly paid, but more risky. Public employment, much more security, state pension, stable salary and so on, but, but lower pay. And so public sector workers tend to want the state to hold on to high tax revenue, increase high public spending. People increasingly in the private sector, if I'm right, should, should, should want that decline. So, what am I saying? In terms, you know, we, we're seeing growing groups of voters then who I think are increasingly socially liberal, pro-gender equality, gay rights, pro-immigration, pro-environment, but want lower taxes and less market regulation. And they tend to be urban, younger, university educated, employed in the private sector in smaller businesses, 
consuming private housing, pensions, healthcare, et cetera, low reliance on the state, pretty much like Silicon Valley. I actually realized I had these in these slides before I knew I was presenting them here. But anyway, <laughs> my brother-in-law lives in Bernal Heights. He's in the tech sector and, and he's very liberal, except if he has to pay for anything. This is the... So is this true? I mean, you know, can we actually track this? So a large part of the paper is sort of a descriptive mapping exercise rather than, than causally identifying this. So, but I, I, what I did was I took 10 surveys, 10 waves of the European Social Survey, which is a survey every two years uh, across a whole bunch of European countries. 22 countries are in at least six of these waves. Average country sample size is almost 2000. And so you've got a total sample size of about a quarter of a million individuals. And there's a couple of questions in the survey um, that allow you to tap into these dimensions. So there's an economic uh, left-right question, which uh, is about redistribution. Please say to what extent you agree or disagree with each of the following statements. The government should take measures to reduce differences in income levels. So, you know, are you in favor of the government reducing uh, people's incomes um, or reducing differences in income? And then there's a question about immigration. Do you think immigration enriches uh, cultural life or undermines it and there's a question is about uh, about gay rights you in favor of of uh, gay rights and so you know you do classic simple scaling of these things and you then can identify or skip over some of the metrics here what i do is i take this these the data here the how people respond to these questions and i and i allocate people in one of these four quadrants based on their preferences um, but the preferences are anchored as, as the median for every country. So, so it's within each country relative to the median in that country. So uh, across time. So you can see, you know, if you're on the top right hand corner, you're economically free market, but you're socially liberal. That we're calling these people right liberals. Then we've got left liberals, left traditionalists and right traditionalists. And this is how they look over time, just descriptively. If you take sort of Western Europe and Eastern Europe, 2002 to 2020, that's the proportion of voters. Um, over time. And you can see how in Western Europe up there, the, the left traditionals are there in the dark red. You can see them declining. And you can see both right-wing liberals and left-wing liberals growing over time. In Eastern Europe, there already was a large group of free market, socially liberal voters in, in, in Central Eastern Europe. It doesn't look like it's declining. But equally in Central Eastern Europe, you can see the left traditionalists declining over time. What's interesting is if you break it down by age, so Western Europe under 40s, very few left traditionalists left amongst um, under 40s in Western Europe. Um, and you can see how in Eastern Europe, it's also declining fast. And you can see amongst the younger voters, you do see proportionally younger voters, almost 60 over 60% of younger voters are socially liberal, and but they tend to be split 50-50 between whether they're more free market or more uh, economically interventionist, and it's grown over time. You can see amongst the older voters, tend to be more more uh, traditional, but, but still, even amongst older voters, you can see how uh, you're seeing these values growing over time. And in Eastern Europe, amongst younger voters in Eastern Europe, overwhelmingly, the modal voter amongst under 40s in Eastern Europe is a free market liberal, but socially liberal. So what I did is said, let's look at what are the correlates of these ideological types. On the left-hand side here, I've got tr trying to predict you take, are you one zero left-wing liberal or not? Are you one zero right-wing liberal or not? And so on. And then let's look at the correlates of this. Um, and we're focusing on age, education, sexual employment, private or public sector, gender, and then controls. And we've got country fixed effects and year fixed effects. here. And these then are the results. So how you read this is to say, if you're above zero here, it says that it predicts that you're more likely to be in that group or not. So you can see how under 40 here cor correlates very highly with, with uh, predicts very nicely you being right liberal, both in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe. Um, and being in the private sector also predicts both right wing liberal plus right wing traditionalist. University educated predicts both left wing liberal <laughs> and right wing liberal. And gender, interestingly, um, more right liberals, you might be surprised to know in Europe, but equally liberal on both of those groups. These are just the correlations. You look over time, it, it looks pretty stable, surprisingly stable, actually, more stable than I, than I expected looking at these data. So you can see how um, under 40s, both in 2002 and in 2020, are, are more likely to be right liberals. You can see how private sector uh, in 2002, less likely to be left-wing liberals, but, but it doesn't look like it's that different now between left liberals or right liberals. 
university education, you can see how 2020 university education correlates much more highly with both left and right liberals, whereas back in 2002, it was less clear. And then I played around with different sorts of interaction effects. Here. So the, the comparison baseline here is someone over 40 without a university education in the public sector, my dad, basically, kind of older civil servant, left school at 16. Um, so you can see here, um, so what are we? We're under 40s, university educated in the public sector if you're in higher education. I guess uh, this would be, you know, you're a very strongly predicts that you're, you're a left-wing liberal, you're a, a Greens type or, or, or left liberal. Um, university educated under 40 in the private sector is both left-wing liberal and right-wing liberal. And you can see here amongst the over 40 uh, voters, the private sector is really predicting you being uh, free market as opposed to not free market. So I think there's pretty strong evidence that university education, being younger, being in the private sector is, is quite strongly predicting, particularly in Western Europe. As you can see how in Eastern Europe, even amongst the older generations, it's, it's university educated who are, who, are, who are clearly free market liberals. And I thought, okay, does this matter? Does this predict your voting behavior? So let's take your ideological position. And does this predict then who you vote for? And so first of all, I thought, let's show you the, the, the vote shares over time in Europe. So this is actually from the ESS data, but this is just maps nicely with real world data with real elections. Uh, but this is just who you voted for, which political family you voted for. So the colors here are the different political families of parties in Europe based on the map that I showed you earlier. And you can see how mainstream center left and mainstream center right, social Democrats and conservatives have declined over time. Liberals have grown over time, and the radical right has also grown over time. So, you know, of course, voting for Le Pen or UKIP in the UK or AFD in Germany or the PIS in Poland or Orban in Hungary. So you can see how, so how that has grown over time as well. And you can see how Greens also have grown recently. And then if you break it down and look at each of the four quadrants here or in the two-dimensional space and look at who, over, who they voted for over time, you can see how... Um, Left-wing liberal voters, so people who place themselves in, who are based on their preferences, are in the left liberal quadrant, increasingly vote for social democrats. And you can see how this growth in green, up, overwhelmingly voting for green, but pretty slow increase in votes for, for, lib, for liberals. And you can see it's amongst the right-wing liberals, you can see this, this, this real growth in support for liberals and a decline in support for social democrats and a decline in support for the mainstream centre-right. Right traditionalists decline in support for the center right, increase in support for the radical right. And left traditionalists increase in support for the radical right, decline in support for the mainstream center left and mainstream center right. So then I thought, let's look and see if we can predict who you vote for based on your ideological type with or without control. So you can think about, let's put these controls in. And if you like it saying, can I take away all the structural factors that might explain who you vote for? And then see if it's purely ideology over and above those structural factors that explain who you might vote for in elections. So on the left-hand side of these models without the controls and on the right-hand side are with the controls. And it doesn't actually make that much difference. So left liberals overwhelmingly vote for these parties on the left. The dark red there is the radical left, the green parties or the social democrats. Right-wing liberals voting for greens or voting for liberals right traditionalists voting for liberals or voting for the mainstream center right, um, and a little bit voting for the radical right. All of these, by the way, are in comparison to left traditional voters. I've got lots of other graphs if you're interested, which I can show you uh, in Q&A. And then I thought, okay, this is largely descriptive. Can I get a little bit closer to causality here? Um, and you, the way to do that with this sort of research is to use panel data. So you can actually look at individuals, the same individual over time. So this is, if you change, once you go to university, does that change how you vote? If you move job from the public to the private sector, does that change your preferences? Um, as you get older, once you cross the threshold of being 40 and you're now really old, does this, uh, does this predict, does, do you, does your preferences change or does this change how you vote? So the British election studies are nice survey data. Every six months, they survey the same people every six months ask them the same battery of questions. There's a lot of panel studies now in, in European countries, but not many of them ask enough political questions. So this is one that is really nice. It asks loads and loads of nice political questions. 2014 to 2023 is the panel data. 
Um, most people, uh, are, so you get approximately 30,000 surveyed in each wave with an overlap of around about 20,000 between waves. Um, I, I've got over 400,000 observations in total, almost 100,000 separate respondents, so approximately four observations across waves per respondent. The two questions I've got here are pretty similar to those European Social Survey questions. I've got a question about redistribution. Some people feel that the government should make much greater efforts to make people's incomes more equal. Other people feel they should be less concerned about this. You know, how do you feel about this? And so I just split this. If you're above the middle of the category, then you're more uh, pro-redistribution or you're below it, you're more anti-redistribution. And then you've got an immigration question. Do you think that immigration undermines or enriches, enriches Britain's cultural life? So exactly the same question as in the European Social Survey. And again, the same sort of model here, I, predicting your ideological type based on the same kind of factors. The difference here is I'm going to show you two different types of models. One model which just pulls everybody together, just take the BES survey data and run the same kind of thing with the BES survey data as with the European Social Survey data. And then the other one is putting in these individual fixed effects. This is saying controlling for the individual, so which is then looking at does the individual actually change over time? So what you're getting is education here is showing the individual themselves now went to university or sector means the individual themselves actually switched from the public to the private sector or from the private to the public sector. The individual themselves beca became over 40. They don't go backwards. They only go one way. The age. <laughs> And of course, gender drops out. We don't have anyone changing their gender in the BES data yet. Um, and so here you have it. So these are the predictors of, of being left liberal, predictors of being right liberal, and so on here. The blue dots are the pooled and aggregated across all individuals. The green, the, the red dots are the within individual effects. And the, interestingly, the only one that is actually, there's only a couple of things that are statistically significant here within individual is this one. So private sector, moving to the private sector means people become right liberal in terms of their values. Um, and moving to the private sector also means people become left traditional in terms of their values. Um, the blue dots show that on average, so for example, if we take university education, on average, people who are university educated are much more likely to be left liberal. But going to university doesn't actually change that. So this is consistent with a lot of research in sociology that suggests most of this is a selection effect. People who are already socially liberal and more left-wing orientation, they're already the ones who choose to go to university. Even if you look at individuals within households that have been trying to identify this, but the actual effect of going to university doesn't seem to kind of brainwash people into being woke left-wing liberal. And then I did the same with the election data, looking at vote choice. Uh, putting the ideological type on the right-hand side, and we've got between and within uh, individual effects here, and we've got separate models for each of the British political parties, Conservatives, Labour, Liberal Democrat, UKIP, that's the radical right, Scottish National Party, and the Greens. So the colours of the parties are down here, Greens, Labour, Scottish National Party, Lib Dem, Conservatives, and UKIP. Um, these are the sort of aggregated, because there's so many observations, there's no confidence intervals, you just get a dot here. So you can see right traditionalist voters vote to vote for conservatives here, less likely to vote for Labour, right wing liberals more likely to vote conservative, more likely to vote Liberal Democrat, less likely to vote Labour. And you can see left liberals voting um, Liberal Democrat, SNP, Labour and the Greens and far less likely to vote conservative and UKIP as you'd expect. What's interesting is this within individual effect, which means if you move from one wave to another wave from being a something else to being a left liberal. Or if you moved from one wave to the next wave from being something else to being a right liberal, or from one wave to the next wave, something else to being a right traditionalist, does this change your voting behavior? And it looks like it does. So this is, this is you can see, if you suddenly become a left liberal, you're, far, you're more likely to vote Lib Dem, Labour, or Green. If you become a right liberal, you're more likely to vote uh, SNP, Lib Dem, or Conservative. If you become a right traditionalist, you're more likely to vote conservative. So it suggests that actually, you know, these ideological, so it's a kind of two-step. Going into the private sector, uh, being a younger voter, being more highly educated, looks like these things start to correlate with being right liberal as well. Some of those things also with being left liberal. And if you become 
you take on those ideological values, that will influence your, your voting behavior. So what have we got? So from where we started from, I think what we're seeing in Europe is growing group of voters we can think of as right-wing liberals. So free market liberals, but also socially liberal. Um, a distinct ideological type who often been forgotten in European uh, electoral politics. Cross-sectional evidence suggests that they tend to be university educated, younger, and employed in the private sector. They're increasingly relevant. Why? Because they're a group that's growing in size, and they're increasingly pivotal as they shift away from other parties to liberal parties in Europe. And we're seeing this in recent elections. In fact, we've seen this most recently in the Finnish election, where the Finnish Conservative Party moved itself to, dis to be more sort of free market liberal to and, more and socially liberal to distance itself from the true Finns. And, and won the election. And, and now it's now deciding who do they form a government with and the expectation is they may well form a government with the left-wing social democrats rather than with the, the more radical right. Evidence from the UK panel data shows that when individuals move to the private sector, they become more right liberal. And when people become right liberal, they're more likely to vote conservative or Lib Dem. Now, let's think about rolling this forward. And this is where I think the research starts to get very interesting as, it, as we raise some broader questions here. Demographic change. If this is a cohort effect, not an age effect, and I'm going to next run some cohort models to see if this is a cohort effect. If this is a cohort effect, traditional voters will die out. So we're then left with just right wing and left wing liberals. So maybe this whole focusing on that second dimension of sort of value politics of social conservatism versus social liberalism, at least in Europe. Is a temporary phenomenon as these older voters die out and as, as younger voters are all relatively pro-gay rights, pro-gender equality, liberal on immigration, liberal on these social questions, will we see a return to the economic dimension as the main dimension of politics? It's kind of comfortable, I think, for a social scientist who feel much better talking about or analyzing the economic dimension of politics. If so, we will see emergent or re-emergence of electoral battles in Europe between left-wing liberals versus right-wing liberals, which in a sense, is the politics. In a sense, in the 1950s, we had left traditionalists versus right traditionalists. And then we've had this period of kind of interregnum through the 60s, 70s, and 80s of change. And gradually, are we now going to evolve back to a new form of politics where everybody has shifted up on that second dimension? And now we're just going to have battles between left wing liberals and right wing liberals. Um, so, in a sense, hitch out was a sort of temporary phenomenon in European politics. Thank you. So we can open up to the Q&A. So, Thanks. I have two um, somewhat related questions. So um, you show there's more liberals now and in, in younger generations and so on. And, um, but what seems most surprising to me um, or most, it's not a surprise, but sort of a, a, a bigger question uh, or a big question is um, why do so few liberals vote for liberal parties? Hmm? Um, even, I mean, 10, 20 years ago, um, and now with the, I mean, maybe liberal parties in some countries are doing better, not in a country like Belgium or, or so, but in, in some other countries. So why are they still not doing better if people have become so much more liberal? Um, and um, some smaller question, second question, a bit related to that is uh, whether um, you've look, looked at the effect of electoral systems uh, in, in this whole story. Yeah. I haven't yet looked at the, the electoral system story. And partly the reason why I haven't done that is because all across Europe, regardless of the electoral system, we're seeing fragmentation of the votes, fragmentations of the party system. So, so even in the UK, we see an increasing number of parties, an increasing number of options. And in other research that I'm doing um, using the European Social Survey data, we, we find that younger voters are far more likely to vote for smaller parties. So if you just take, if you can't take everyone over 40 and calculate the effective number of parties, and everyone under 40 and calculate the effective number of parties, you see many, many more parties for people under 40 than over 40. So, so and that's irrespective of the electoral system. The electoral system maybe gives you a sort of fixed effect there, but, but even regardless of electoral system, we're seeing this fragmentation of the vote. And so I think you're seeing far more options for younger voters or younger voters more willing to vote for parties they want to vote for. 
why do we not see everyone vote for, for or why do we not see all the right-wing liberals voting for liberals? Well, that's a bit like asking, why do we not see all the left-wing liberals voting for social democrats or greens? I mean, there's many other factors that influence who, which parties people ultimately choose, not just their ideological preferences. There's, there's, there's legacies of family effects, there's, there's regional effects, there's network effects, there's also valence and leadership effects. And so, so there's lots of other factors that I think are predicting how people vote. Ideology is only one, people's personal ideological makeup on the small subset of questions that I've asked here, I think is only making up one small part of it. Thanks. Um, I'm curious whether or how this story maps onto the idea that the economic dimensions falls out into two different dimensions. And I'm sure you get this question every time you get this talk, <laughs> but I'm still very curious about, about the answer, especially because um, uh, you know we, we would expect that these younger people care more about investment-oriented policies that focus more on things like education and uh, childcare for all, and that they might care less about uh, more redistributive um, uh, dimensions. So. Um, yeah, it, it's what we're seeing really that people become less states, that these people want less states, or do they just want a different state? Yeah, I and mean, it's difficult with, uh, it, it's very difficult to answer that with this sort of data, right? Because the only question we have is this redistribution question. So it could well be that you're seeing younger, highly educated voters living in cities, working in the private sector as saying, you know, I, I don't want to pay high taxes if this money is going to be just about redistribution, but I'm willing to pay high taxes if this is going to be building more public housing, for example, that would be reducing housing costs. Because because for a lot of younger voters living in cities, it's it, it, so I remember I got in a, a sort of Twitter argument with Rob Ford at Manchester after the last British election when he said, look, the survey data show that officially Labour's the party of the middle class and the Tories are the party of the working class because look, the higher, higher income and higher educated voters vote Labour and the low income, low educated voters are voting, cons voting Conservative. I said, but, Chris, but Rob, really, you know, he's making a big thing. What is really happening is older, lower educated voters, retirees living in suburban areas who've paid off their mortgages and sitting on their private and their public pension. Uh, and so they've got no income because they're retired. And they didn't go to university because they're older voters and that, there wasn't the pre-university expansion. They're voting conservative. And the younger, highly educated voters who are earning lots of money are living in cities where huge proportions of their take-home pay is being spent on rent. And uh, who really are the working class here in this kind of setup? So it's like class doesn't really work in the way that it used to work in this kind of setup. So you, you may be right that these younger voters are sort of economically free market when it comes to, to regulation or business regulation, for example, or say taxes on labor, which is obviously a big issue in a lot of countries in Europe. They want lower taxes on labor, particularly if they're working in small businesses or they're running small businesses, particularly in the new creative industries. And they're saying that the big drain on the creative industries is, is regulation of labor markets, for example. And so they'd be far more liberal on those sorts of questions. Um, but then they might well be in supportive of electoral promises that would be in favor of saying, using the state to promote climate change policy, for example, uh, public investments in uh, new technologies that are climate technologies or public investments in public transport. Um, so, you know, high-speed rail or these sorts of things or public investments in public housing or, or public childcare and things. So we don't know yet. And I think you need other data to try and tease that out. Hey, thanks so much. I'm Jim Goldgeier. I'm a visiting scholar here. Um, so just curious your thoughts, I mean, on on sort of the the thinking of these um, individuals uh, who are, I mean, individuals who are socially liberal and free market strike me as very consistent. I mean, I don't know if government... Government out of my life. Keep all government all out of my life. Yeah. Right? Social, and, yeah. okay. Except on environmental issues. I mean, you could, if you really are pro environment, you got to be pro regulation and you got to be more pro government investment. I think, maybe not. Maybe, maybe you're just, maybe you're just a technology, you're going to be like, I'm socially liberal and we're going to have technology solutions to our climate change problem. But I just curious. Yeah, so I think there's several out. interesting things happening in European politics on that. So one is, is, 
you're seeing actually a separate, you know, so we used to say that the envir environment is part of that second dimension of politics. So if you're high on the second dimension of politics, so you're, you know, but why necessarily do you think you should, the, all these things should correlate? Why, if you're in favor of gay rights and gender equality and pro-immigration and opposed to the death penalty, uh, why should you also be pro-environment? There's no, it doesn't necessarily have to correlate like that. We've kind of amalgamated all these things, just happen to be that they look like they correlated, but they, that might well have been for a particular period. And we're starting to see that separate. So we're starting to see, for example, in Switzerland, they've got two green parties, one green party on the left and one green party on the right. And the Green Party on the left says we need state intervention and we need kind of social justice as part of the transformation of the green and green transformation. And the party on the right saying, no, no, we just want kind of tax incentives to encourage people to invest in green technology. And, and the market will get there as we raise the costs of, 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 you know, fossil fuels. And, you know, we need kind of to encourage market instruments to get us there. So so very different. So they're both they're, they both agree we need to address climate change, but they've got very different solutions about how to get there. And so, so that's, I, I think we're seeing a separation of environmental issues. The other thing that's happening, I think, in Europe, as the rubber hits the road on environment policy, environment policy stops becoming a valence issue and starts becoming a redistributive issue, meaning everybody's in favor of the environment. Oh yeah, we're all in favor of the government addressing the environment. All parties now say that they, they want to meet the Paris goals and and then suddenly, actually, how are you going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for it? I mean, we saw this in France with the Gilets jaunes. The Gilets jaunes was an anti-environment protest, after all, because Macron, being the kind of typical urban economic elite living in Paris, thought, who really cares about a few cents on, on gas at the pump? Well, uh, and we'll use that to discourage, to, to invest in, in new green technologies to transform towards electric cars. But of course, it disproportionately falls on poor rural voters who are dependent on transport. And so then they start protesting. So suddenly now, a lot of environment policy starts becoming re classic redistributive policy, or just winners and losers. Who are the winners and losers of these policies? There's been some great research on the Netherlands, for example, looking at how the losers of the new environment policies increasingly vote for the radical right in the Netherlands. Um, and we're seeing other uh, those sorts of things starting to happen. So, so I think we are going to start to see that. The thing about these sorts of voters, it's pretty easy for them to be pro-environment because they, they they tend to be urban. So they 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 don't tend in Europe. They, that means they're not driving cars. They're using public transport. They often don't own cars. Um, they're often living in new-built housing, which tends to be kind of quite insulated already. And they're not living in old houses that need a lot of things replaced or the boiler replaced or this sort of stuff. So, I mean, it's really, it's cheaper for them to be in, in favor of pro-environment policies. It's much more expensive for older voters living in rural areas in their big old house where someone's got to pay for the replacement of their boiler because the boiler doesn't meet the new environment standard uh, and drives around in an old diesel kind of three liter engine car I mean, it's kind of, you can see how the politics just play out now a lot of the younger voters actually quite i mean my 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 kids if i tell them this way it's very cheap for you guys to be in favor of the environment you don't have to pay for this stuff i'm paying for it so. we had a question um alexander uh, gotinakos wants to know um what's your intuition about the youngest voters moving to these fragmented places why are younger voters so fragmented uh i think it's because they, well, several things. One is they're not, um, that they, they don't have the party identification that they're inheriting from their parents. So parents' generation, older generations tended to vote for party. Once you vote for a party, they're sort of habitually voting for that party. And a lot of voters are sticky. Once they vote for this party, it's going to take something quite a lot to, to move. Younger voters coming in at the first time in the first elections are experiencing not necessarily voting for those mainstream parties. And so... And then also we've, we've got lots of different types of elections. And so they experience voting for different parties at different elections. And so then they, they tend to treat, treat elections like shopping rather than, rather than team sports, right? It's kind of, um, so I, I think it's culturally something very, very different that has been going on in terms of the way European politics is working. And in many ways, in this sense, Western Europe is becoming more like Eastern Europe in terms, in terms of party choices and high electoral volatility. We, we've got Ruth Dassonville visiting the UI in a few weeks, and she's just written a book about electoral volatility, and she's showing how electoral volatility has really grown enormously across Europe. And so it's, it, it's it, which so levels of electoral volatility in Western Europe are coming pretty close to, to Eastern Europe. Aren't they? <laughs> uh, thank you. This is fascinating. 
how do the uh, trends that you've identified about here track with party programs and platforms? So the platforms lag this or are they leading it? Or are they failing to change and that accounts for the fragmentation part of it? Yeah, I think uh, the jury is out here. And in terms of the research, there's people who can, can show some types of research that show that the voters respond to parties and others that show the parties respond to voters. I think part of the story for this particular group of voters is what is happening to the mainstream center right. Because the mainstream center right used to be a broad coalition in Europe, mainstream, you know, when you think about German Christian Democrats or British conservatives, and it was a broad coalition of sort of big business interests, small business interests, old agricultural interests, and sort of older sort of socially conservative voters. And that's a kind of an amalgam. They could kind of hold together by being sort of moderate on that second dimension of politics and moderately free market. And that was sort of not great for any of those voters, but good enough and very different to what social democrats were offering. But then we saw the emergence of the populist right. The populist right emerged saying we're, we, we don't like um, you know, urban liberals, we don't like the new values that are coming along, a backlash against the cultural liberalism, very anti-immigration, uh, op opposing global markets, wanting the state to intervene. And they sort of outflank mainstream center-right parties. And all across Europe, mainstream center-right parties start drifting towards them. So we've seen that in, in, in France, we've seen that in the UK with the British Conservatives, we've seen that in the Netherlands with parties moving towards what the more radical right parties. It's the big debate in Germany right now, is the CDU gonna move much more to the AFD? In Italy, we see Meloni now, the radical right actually win and, and the mainstream center right almost completely collapse. But if that, that by doing, making that move, that breaks the old alliance. Because there's a whole bunch of voters who are, who are sort of moderately socially liberal and economically free market who say, I can't vote for these guys anymore. They're now cross pressured. So they're now, they're now, so I think that's a story of the fact the party's moving because they've been outflanked. And these voters now find themselves, like the Waitrose woman voter, Sebastian Payne po pointed out, is exactly the voter who's saying, I don't want to vote for these guys anymore. And we're seeing this in a lot of places in Europe. Those voters are up for grabs. And those voters, some, some places they vote for Greens. Some places they vote for liberal parties. Some places they vote for the mainstream center left. They're voting for other parties. And so, and, and you know, you think about that in the US, the classic, you know, Hoover voter, sort of liberal free market, uh, but more, you know, socially progressive type voter. Who are they voting for? They, they used to be mainstream solid Republicans. They're not mainstream solid Republicans anymore, particularly with the Republican party in the US. Where are they now? Well, it depends who the Democrats are putting up as the Democratic candidate, is I think the question. And so that, that's a similar sort of thing that's happening in Europe. So I think the story is about the movement and, and the strategic decisions a lot of mainstream center-right parties have made. Just quick follow-up. Does that drive toward single issue politics? You can't vote for the package because it's not where you are. So picking out one or another issue or personality. Yeah, I, I'm a bit skeptical of that. I, I think because issues come and go and, and you know, if you ask a bunch of, if you ask voters what they're in favor of, they tend to have quite inconsistent preferences for a whole range of issues. So voters will say, yeah, I'd like lower taxes, but I want more public spending on healthcare and I'd like more to pay, you know. So they kind of inconsistent preferences. So you still have to have, these still have to be, I think it can depend, and in certain countries, in certain elections, certain issues become dominant. But it's difficult to predict what those issues are at any one point in time. So in Europe right now, the environment is quite a big issue in lots of places. Immigration was the dominant issue for, the, for about a decade. It's a little bit overshadowed now by, of course, what's been going on in Ukraine with the war. And so, you know, immigration tends to be less of a salient issue. But, but in Italy now, immigration is really back as an issue as we're starting to see you know, boat people coming across. And as we get towards the, towards the summer months, we're gonna see many more migrants coming across the Mediterranean. And so immigration will be back on the agenda in Italy and probably back on the agenda in Spain too. So, so it's context specific. Um, yeah. 
Hi, I'm I'm really sorry I, I arrived late, <laughs> so I missed your presentation. But I do have a question, I, and I'm sorry I I, I uh, it's a little bit outside maybe of the discussion. Um, I live in France, and uh, I wanted to know, given your you know, given what's happened, and given you know the fragmentation and mm -hmm. everything, right? Uh, there's a lot of talk of Marine Le Pen being elected next time around. Do you have any thoughts or anything? Could happen. Could absolutely happen. Um, I mean, the big question is what happens to the coalition that Macron has put together? Um, Macron was lucky first time round and emerged uh, when there wasn't a good candidate for the center left or for the center right. It was probably the, the French Republicans would have won had there not been the scandals with Fillon. Uh, and so he managed to put together a coalition of voters which were the, the liberal wing of the Social Democrats, some of the more pro-green voters who were not sort of very left-wing green voters, but moderate green voters, and the sort of bulk of the French business community and private sector interests. And that's the kind of coalition he built. Now, if there, can he hold that together? That will probably fragment and go back after if, you know, it's a voting for him rather than for his party. Um, you can then see that fragmenting and voting for the large chunk of it going back to the mainstream center right, who essentially he's now governing with. So the Re Republican could then emerge. Is there going to be a, so, so you could see three or four major forces in French politics ahead of the next presidential election. Probably um, Le Pen will, will get through, or if it's not Marine Le Pen, it could be the, another Le Pen, getting through to the second round of the presidential election. And then I think the jury's out again. It was, it, she's getting closer, or that party's getting closer. But it's not, the other thing I'd say is, it's not the same, the, the, the Rassemblement National is not the same as the old Front National in France. They are a more moderate party. Yes, they're, they're more radical than, than the centrist parties in France, but they're not as radical, they're not as extremist on immigration, they're not as extremist on Europe, not an extremist on some of the social questions as the old, uh, as her father's party was. Um, and because she's deliberately tried to moderate the party to take voters away from the mainstream center right. So the same thing's happening in, in, in Italy with Meloni. So Meloni, Meloni won the election because she was the only party that was not in government. Uh, they had a very broad grand coalition and she became the opposition. She took a lot of votes away from the moderate center right, Berlusconi's party, Forza Italia, and for the other populist right party, Lega. And we used to think of Fratelli d'Italia as to the right of Lega. We now think of them as to the left of Lega and encroaching on Forza Italia's voters. And Berlusconi has now just been diagnosed with, with leukemia. And so the party is probably going to collapse. She's going to, she has a potential to reposition herself as the dominant force on the center right in Italian politics. And the same thing could happen in France. That's the strategy that Le Pen wants in France. She wants to replace the mainstream center right in France. And ironically, it's much harder for her to do that if Macron collapses because his voters are then gonna go back and support probably a large chunk of his voters will go back and would support the Republicans. Um. So I'm a little confused because at the end of the presentation, you mentioned how uh, we're kind of seeing maybe a trend more toward everyone being liberal and it's becoming just a pure right versus left political landscape. Mm -hmm. But now you've talked about how actually right wing populism is maybe on the rise in like France and Italy. So how does it bode for the future of populism? Is populism itself becoming more centrist? like right-wing kind of populist parties or, or yeah, what's the? Yeah, I mean, several of these are going on at once and these are long trends that I'm talking about because populism, support for populist parties or those sorts of values tends to be an older cohort of voters. Um, you do see some younger voters vote for these parties in say France or in Italy. Uh, and, and there's a question mark about why that might be. Uh, in the last election in Italy, for example, the younger voters who voted for, for Maloney tended to be in the South, 
and they were, they were employed and they were annoyed about the fact that the previous government has introduced a policy of paying universal benefits uh, to people who are unemployed. And basically in the south of southern of Italy, a lot of people were taking these universal benefits and working illegally. And so if you were formally employed and paying your taxes, you started to get really annoyed about this. And so she was playing on those kind of fears among sort of younger educated voters in their 30s. Uh, but I don't think they share her views necessarily on immigration or Catholic Church or the family or anything like that, which the older voters tend to. And we're seeing value shifts in Europe, in a sense. We're seeing, I do think that some of these older voters, it's a backlash against the sort of cultural shifts that we've seen happening. So the sort of last hurrah of, of, a, of these voters. And, and yes, they'll still be there and those values will still be there, but they'll be decreasingly relevant, I think, over time. Um, Right now, they make up 10 to 15% of the voters in most countries in Western Europe, perhaps a little bit more in Eastern Europe, but in Western Europe, around 10 to 15% of the voters. And, and they tend to be, interestingly, these populist parties emerged as right-wing populist parties, sort of socially conservative, but free market. They're gradually drifting leftwards on economic issues. Um, the bulk of voters that are really there to be captured are left-wing traditionalists, so sort of socially conservative, economically interventionist. A lot of these parties find it really problematic to appeal to those voters. And I think this is largely to do with who's funding these parties. These parties originally were founded by libertarian think tanks, hedge funds. I remember talking to Nigel Farage over dinner in London when I was chair of the government department at LSE for, for four years. I chaired Nigel Farage twice speaking at the LSE. For, went for dinner after the guy's a big drinker and he gets drunk and then he starts speaking the truth if you like so and he starts saying wow really i'm a free market libertarian uh, and was and we were all kind of saying well shouldn't you be in favor of kind of immigration if you're kind of free? well yeah of course i am but of course the voters aren't and so you, you, you know he came out of a lot of these radical right parties were originally founded as libertarian anti-state parties on the right and realizing oh, that's only a small number of voters that will support that. And so now we have to kind of, what issues can we grab to kind of increase our support base? And they figured immigration is a good one. Let's go for that one. And they become very anti-immigrant, but they won't compromise necessarily on those economic issues because that's where they started from. And a lot of the funders of these parties, the funders of UKIP or the funders of the AFD or the funders of Maloney's party are often free market liberal think tanks bankrolled by hedge funds and these types of things. And they will not let these parties become too lefty on economics. They won't let them promise higher taxes and more public spending. So I think that's why we see, we've got this empty space in the bottom left-hand corner of European politics. I'm going to exercise my privilege and ask a question. Um, so I guess there are two questions that I have. One is, so when does this start, right? What are the structural forces that motivate this? Because this, if the change in the welfare state system affects everyone, and yet only some voters become left liberal, right? And the second question is, why do we see such a much higher rate of left liberals in East Central Europe? Is this just an artifact of so voter distributions and then being more closely Trump? Yeah, so I think there's two things there. So, so one is, I think we're seeing this now because it is a combination of factors, right? So. I think university education is correlating with, with growing social liberalism in general. We're then seeing a combination of changes in the private sector, decline of big private sector employees and a growth of small businesses. Um, a lot of people employed in the private sector are on short-term contracts now rather than long-term contracts. The fast growing industries in most cities in Europe are the creative industries, film, fashion design, art, media, tourism, this sort of stuff. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's the restaurateurs and, uh, and, and, you know, the, the interior design and all the other stuff that's happening in most European cities like it is here. That's a big change from the big job for life, private sector type jobs, um, where you, you, which would not be that different to the public sector. You might be paid a little bit more and you have maybe a small private pension. But now the vast, the difference between being employed in the public sector, being employed in the private sector is vastly different. And that's, that's grown over the last 20 or 30 years. And as a result of that, that is correlating, I think, with changes in consumption patterns in terms of what, what kind of services you consume in the public and the private sector. So it's the combination of, and we're seeing people are looking at risk and we're seeing people are looking at, and, and I kind of, in a sense, I'm sort of putting it together as an electoral story mm -hmm. here. So that's the first thing. 
Central Eastern Europe, I, in some ways, Western Europe is catching up Central Eastern Europe. The, the dimension in Central Eastern Europe for a while has been the sort of free market liberals against the against the more social conservative plus left wing voters. I mean, that was the post communist story. Uh, and so a lot of this, the, 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 the new, the sort of Tusk type voters in, in Eastern Europe are, are, are exactly these types of voters in Western Europe. It's the urban, cosmopolitan, global, professional elite. The, yeah, th those are the voters in Central Eastern Europe who are in favor of liberalism against communism and in favor of free markets and in favor of more liberal social values as well. And so that, in a sense, Eastern Europe was ahead of Western Europe in this, in this trend. And maybe Western Europe is again converging in Eastern Europe after all. Although it's good there seems to be between left liberals and the populist right wing as opposed to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, I had a question about um, the social, um, you know, like left versus right. Um, dimension, um, particularly with the influx of the immigrant population, um, and as like second generation of immigrants um, enter the voting mm -hmm. populace, how do you think that will change or potentially impact? Because um, you were talking about how, right, the conversation about the social um, spectrum might not really be as big of a deal, but perhaps do you think the um, immigrant population or second generation might impact, um, like? Yeah perhaps bringing in more of a conservative type of perspective? Very, very good question. And um, not enough research on that, partly because we don't have good enough survey data to look at preferences of, of migrants and migrant voters in Europe. Uh, my colleague, former colleague at OSE, Tony Travers, is an expert on London. And he said, London is a fascinating place because at the same time, it's becoming more socially liberal. It's also becoming more socially conservative. <laughs> You're getting more polarization amongst the sort of London urban liberals on the one hand, but then the massive influx of sub-Saharan Africans, Nigerians, uh, South, East, South Asians, uh, particularly, and, and socially conservative uh, Bangladeshi and Pakistani families and so on. But you tend, to get, you tend to get intergenerational conflicts in those families as the younger generations in those families are adopting exactly the same sorts of values um, of, their, of the people in their classroom. My, my daughter, my kids are 22 and 19 now. My daughter grew up in London and, and went to a, state school and in her class in her 30 kids in the state school there were three white kids and 27 kids from the rest of the world um, overwhelmingly Indian subcontinent and and what she tells was that there was a big split in the values amongst them depending on whether they had professional parents or not so if you were Indian subcontinent with professional parents you tended to have no problem they didn't have problems with their kids behaving like so these are young women behaving like sort of classically English young women as, as teenagers going out and getting drunk and wearing makeup and mini skirts. And, and whereas if you were from a more lower class sort of shopkeepers or, or lower skilled family background, they tend to be more socially conservative and they stop their daughters from doing those types of things. So, so I think there's an intergenerational uh, change that's happening and it's happening more slowly, but I don't think we get can answer that sort of question. We don't have the data for it, unfortunately. I think we've run out of time. Um, Mr. Cohen, thank you very much for a very provocative and uh, innovative uh, talk. And thank you to the audience for coming and to our online audience for attending. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Thanks.